Well, good morning, everybody. Is anybody glad to be in church today? We're so glad that you're with us. We're so glad that you've joined us online. We're so happy that you're with us today. We're excited about what the Lord is going to do in this house. Is there anybody excited about what he's going to do in this place today? Can we just go ahead and lift our hands in praise and expectation this morning? Because he is a good God. He is an awesome God. He is a great God. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Come on, help me praise him in this place. Oh, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Ah! 
this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony oh I'm alive this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Come on, somebody give him praise because he's changed your testimony today. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we praise you for it, Lord.
want to be with you. You know, the psalmist said, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. There's nothing like being in his presence, amen? Nothing like his presence. Come up here, babe, join me. You got something to say? What to say? <laughs> How many know heaven is a lot closer than you think? And I'm in the midst of the greatest grief of my life. But the word said God is close to those of a contrite spirit. And that in our weakness, he is made strong. So I want to tell you real quick, uh, chap came out. The, should they sit down? Are they supposed to be up? All right, stay up. We might, we might get somewhere today. <laughs> chap has never seen me like this. I think he saw me cry when Chandler moved to Arizona. Outside of that, I'm peed out and strong. But I have been devastated because my dad was the closest person that represented Christ to me in my life. By the way, when I was worshiping, I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, when you want my presence, as much as you want your earthly father's presence, you're going to get somewhere, little girl. But he said it in love. Anyway, chap saw me grieving, did not know what to do because I'd never let him see me cry. So he's, this has been his stance for a couple weeks. What can I do, babe? <laughs> he came out here and prayed for me. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing, something to the effect, Holy Spirit or Father, sin, I can't do anything for her, go to her. And I had been praying unbeknownst to him for a dream about my dad. Because see, the Bible talks about dreams. We spend all of our time walking in the midst of miracles, praying for something else. Dreams are miracles. The sleep cycle is a miracle. The birth of a child is a miracle. The sun coming up is a miracle. You, we have to think heavenly. And God has used this to, I have, I have dug deep in my heart and soul and told God, please teach me to think in the spirit. So back to the, I had told the Lord, I think that you give dreams as, as spiritual. I don't know much about this. I always have to call Karen. But I'm going to get there, sister. <clears throat> and I prayed. All, I have not slept hardly a wink. But when your spirit is broken, you're so open to what he has for you. And Chap had prayed. And I had been saying, I don't know if this is like wrong, but God cover it and stop it if it is. But dad, can you speak to me? Or Holy Spirit, can you just let me know he's okay? Because I know where he is. And I had this dream, and I always tried to get my daddy to dance. But honey, he was old time holiness. He won't shuffle in them feet unless it was the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but I was like, God, please let me know he's okay. Long story short, I had a dream of, coincid not coincidentally, lovingly, he was in the same shirt that was given to me that was, if you ever look on his Facebook, you see that shirt. <clears throat> he was in that shirt. And I know this dream came from the Lord and we were at this place that we're familiar with and he was dancing and dancing and he goes, come on, Suge. And I was dancing with him in my dream and I remember spinning under his arm and he held me close and then I went and did something because y'all know I'm ADD. I went and did something <laughs> and I came back. That made it real. And we danced some more and we danced some more and it comforted me so much because I know it was a heavenly dream. So I was talking to Chap yesterday, and I know I'm taking up some time, but guess what? I told Chap, I, it, it rushed to me all at once. In the dream, it didn't exactly feel like my dad's hands because my dad had this problem with the tendons in his hands. And you probably never noticed if you met him, but his hands were like this. And it hit me and Chap all at once. His hands are, are open. His, he is made whole. Yes. And I know that was from the Lord. And here's the takeaway. When me, as helping lead this church, want the Holy Spirit and the Heavenly Father as bad. And look, you're one tragedy away from wanting it bad. When we want Him as badly as we want that thing, 
thing that we all want. We will see revival and it might just start at Heritage. So I love you all. I appreciate everything. I'll never get the thank you cards written. I'm terrible at that anyway, but I got my mama helping me to keep her busy. But keep us in your prayers. And I have no intention of dying in grief, but I have every intention of channeling that into the presence of God. Okay. So I'm going to pray with people dealing with grief. Hmm. In the name of Jesus, rise up in the spirit. We are mind, body, and spirit. So when your mind and body are broken, call upon the spirit of the living God. There is but one true God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph. The Holy Scriptures is where you need to go. It's not about a song necessarily. Quit looking for a sign. Pray for a sign. Open the word. Engulf the word of God. God, I pray, Lord, that our ears will be quickened to the spirit of God and him only. I come against the spirit of bitterness and anger and vengefulness in the mighty name of Jesus. His word says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. We don't step into his place. He is God alone and we are his children. And if we live by his commandments and his precepts and honor him in our daily life, including coming together and not forsaking the the chance to come together with a brother and a sister who you might be the answer to. I pray that we step out of being offended in the name of Jesus. It is a lie from the enemy. Half the time it's a misunderstanding. And if you are offended by someone, you need to go to them and say, Brother, sister, here's what's going on. We ought not come into the presence of God with other believers and not be able to talk to our brothers and our sisters. This is about eternity. So I pray unity over the body of Christ in the name of Jesus. God has not forgotten that dream. If somebody came here today hoping that they would get a word from God about a direction that they want to go and they're frightened, go. But go like David. He came in the name of the Lord and he slayed the giant. Somebody in here is going to slay their giant this week. This week. Because we can't do it on our own. It takes the Spirit of God and walking in His way. We're so entitled. I deserve this. You deserve that. You didn't deserve that to happen to you. It's not about that. Walk in the Spirit of God. Obey what He says to do. We're falling short, y'all, because it says love your enemy. That's where I'm at. My dad was tied down for two weeks in five-point restraints, and he was the gentlest lamb of a man and the closest thing to Jesus I've ever seen. The enemy went for the jugular, but guess what? He messed with the wrong daughter because my dad taught me to walk in forgiveness, baby. Don't worry about it. Two days before he died, he said, I got to talk to you and Nisi. Get her on the phone. Get her on the phone. We put him on speaker. We couldn't hardly understand him. He said, baby, I'm telling you right now. It hadn't been good, but promise me that you will forgive. Forgive the person who raped you. It sounds crazy, but you got to do it because that's what God has. And look, he's not going to ask you or tell you to do something that he won't help you do. And when that healing comes and it floods over you, and there's a lot of us who have been through terrible things. We've lost parents. We've lost siblings. We've been violated. You know, Sheila, the closest thing to... Jesus that that walked around here, lived in the spirit, gone just like that. But we have to stay faithful because he is faithful. And this is, this life is just the beginning. It's like a vapor. And then we're all going to be made whole. So do what he tells you to do. And God bless you. I didn't mean to preach. Amen. The Lord is good and at work in your life. I'm excited to be in the Lord's presence today. So glad to see you all. Let's greet each other. Welcome each other here to his presence today.
I heard an illustration the other day where someone used a marble to represent every weekend they have with their kids from the time they're born till the time they leave their house. It came out to about a thousand marbles. A thousand marbles. It kind of sounds like a lot, but before you know it, those weekends start slipping away. For me, the hardest thing The thing that really broke my heart was realizing how many handfuls I've already thrown away. So much time wasted. And what do I have to show for it? Life is precious. And even though I've squandered a lot of my time, Now I cherish each one of these marbles. I guess you can say that seeing how much time I waste has changed my perspective on what's important. Careers and hobbies are good things, but they certainly aren't the ultimate things I had made them before. I guess this life is all about perspective. And even though I know I can't spend every weekend with my family, I can certainly try. I can't believe before that I was so dedicated to the things that don't really matter. Me? I've got 728 marbles left. And I can't wait to enjoy each one. Can give me credit before I come up. <laughs> Go straight for the mama's heart. Gosh. Oh my goodness. Well, church, we're back. Praise the Lord. I'm so happy to be back in church. I could hardly stand myself. I'm so glad everybody's back and feeling better, and we are just ready to conquer 2021 with what the Lord has for us. Um, It's Cinema Sunday and Children's Church Day, so I'm gonna go ahead and dismiss the kids so they can jump right in to that. So if you have any school-age children, go ahead and we'll dismiss them. So I wanna read you a verse this morning. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter nine, and it's six through 11. And it says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and have plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then provide a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So I want to encourage you today as we're about to take part in giving that We need to give generously because it says that when we give, not only will we have everything that we'll need, we'll have enough left over to be a testimony to other people. So we need to be cheerful, not got to give money again, smart giving again. They're always asking for money. We need to be a cheerful giver. So we have smart giving, which is the quickest, easiest way you can give. The number's right up here. Just send that in and you'll get a response and you can give quickly. We're not passing the offering buckets around anymore. There is a box in the back if you want to give by check or cash, or you can also mail it in, 513 Johnstown Road. Um, Also, if you want to stay informed with things going on here at the church, text 94,000 like you would for seats. Text the word INFORMED. You can also text prayer, please, if you'd like um, prayer requests. And there's also a tab on the website that you can put for prayer um, at this time. 
So we have something exciting that's happening. We have an app, an Heritage Church app. If you have not downloaded it, downloaded it yet, go ahead. It's Heritage Church Chesapeake. And when it comes up, you'll see our logo. Go ahead and uh, download that. You can have all the live stream and you can give. There's so many cool things that are going to be happening with that. So go ahead and get that downloaded. Let's go ahead and uh, pray over this offering. Father God, we thank you so much for the privilege to be able to give. God, I pray that you would help us to be cheerful givers. God, I pray that everything that we get, I pray that we would have our hands open to be able to give right back to other people. God, I thank you that you are good and you are generous and you are faithful. God, I pray over this offering. I also pray over Chap as he's about to come and bring a word to us. I pray that you would just cover him in your anointing and you would hide him behind your cross. God, we thank you for everything that you have blessed us with. God, and we give all the glory back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take a minute and um, give, and then we will be get ready for Pastor Chap to come share a message with us. So good to see everybody today. Turn with me this morning to the book of Psalms, chapter 119. We're going to read that whole chapter today as I... Uh... <laughs> see, y'all didn't even know. If y'all knew that it was 165 verses, you, I would have got a few more moans and groans. But uh, no, we're not actually going to do that. But we will read from that in a few minutes. Uh, man, it is just good to see you again. And... Uh, I guess I don't even know how long it's been. I guess the Sunday before Christmas was the last time we were here. And so help us spread the word. Help us uh, invite people out. We are, it is such uh, a privilege now to be able to come together and gather corporately. And uh, so we want to take advantage of that. But it is also a, such a blessing um, to, uh, to, do, to do that, to gather. So we are, we are grateful. I just encourage you to invite your family and your friends. If you believe that the Holy Spirit does anything in this house or does anything through us, it's one thing to encourage them to watch online. And, I, and we do want people to do that. And uh, we certainly welcome our online audience today. So glad you're with us. But there's still something special about being in the house. How many of you say amen to that? So uh, we are glad to be in the house. Psalm 119 uh, we're continuing, uh, a few weeks ago, I began a series called You Get What You Order. You Get What You Order. How many of you know that life is kind of like a restaurant? When you walk into a restaurant, what usually happens is you're seated, you place an order for a beverage and an entree, and then hopefully you get what you ordered, and you, you hopefully you get it the way you desire that it be cooked. What I've learned about life is that life is a lot like a restaurant. Life has a menu. And what you choose for life is determining now what you're living in. And it is, it is determining where your life is going to end up and where you're headed, the direction you're going. We talked a few weeks ago about how important choices are. They are very important. And we make lots of them every day. Some of them not so significant. Um, because they don't really make that much difference in the future or the destiny of our life. But some of the choices we make are very important and very significant because that's exactly what they do. They determine where we're headed, and they determine the life that we now have to live. They, etern they determine eternity. So in, uh, choices are very important. And, uh, you know, when it comes to that understanding and that truth... The fact of re accepting or rejecting that responsibility. Some people, I hope you have accepted that truth. Uh, just like when you go to a restaurant, you don't want anybody else picking for you off the menu, do you? Of course not. 
But when it comes to life, you shouldn't want other people making decisions for you. You shouldn't want other people determining where your life is headed. So uh, we take responsibility for the, the, the fact that we make the choices that determine our life. The people that reject that responsibility, they think God is to blame for everything. And if you go through something troublesome, that's God's fault. Proverbs 19 talks about those kinds of people. The, the, the writer of the Proverbs says, People ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they're angry at the Lord. But how many of you know that God is not to blame? Now, there are always going to be uh, some things that you might have to go through and encounter that were not of your choosing or not of your choices. Um, we all have things that we experience that are out of our control. But for the most part, the life that you are now living is a result of the choices that you have made. And the reason is why it's because you get what you order. You get what you order in life. You get the result of what you've put in place, what you've allowed and determined in your life. So you get what you order. Today, we're continuing this subject, and today we're going to talk about the order of the heart. The order of the heart. By the way, in the coming weeks, I will be talking next about the order of the home, uh, the role of the father, the role of the mother, the role of children. So be preparing for that. And then I'm going to talk about the order of your harvest, talking about finances, talking about uh, your giving and what you do with that and how, again, we reap the blessing of God. But today it's the order of the heart. When we've decided that we're going to get things in order in our lives, where do you begin? You have to begin with the heart. Why is that? Because just like the physical heart <clears throat> is the engine of the body, the spiritual heart, as referred to in the Bible, symbolizes the center or the core of our being. And within our heart is found what we believe. It's, it's our belief system. And from what I believe comes my actions, my attitudes, my, my behavior. Also, there comes feelings and emotions. And, as, and if all of those things are in their proper order, then everything works all right. But if not, of course, then there's issues, there's trouble. Uh, so, you know... We, the, having a good, healthy, physical heart is important. I have been blessed with a, with a good, so far, a, a healthy physical heart. I have always had good blood pressure. Uh, my resting heart rate is from 48 to 51. I don't know why it's, it's that. Um, I, I can't say I can do, uh, that I've done anything to take credit for getting that heart rate so low. I don't know. My wife just says that's good. You know, a low heart rate. I guess it is good compared to having a, a heart rate of 100 or 120 or something like that. But, you know, uh, it, it maybe you have a, a physical heart that's healthy too. Um, and if you do, that's good. But how many of you know that when it comes to our spiritual heart, it always requires constant examination? constant attention. Why is that? We get some insight into the heart of a man, the heart of a woman by looking at scripture. And before we get to our text, let me give you a few of those this morning. Psalm 27, 19 says this, as a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the real person. The book of Jeremiah, God told the prophet, he said, the heart is deceitful above all things. In other words, it's the most deceitful. It's, it's more deceitful than anything else. Who can know it? Deceitful, desperately wicked, who can know it? That's what God told Jeremiah. Jesus said concerning the heart in Matthew 15, what enters the mouth goes through the stomach and exit the body. But the things which come out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. And these are what defile you. Did you catch that? It's not what goes in you that defiles you. It what, it's what comes out of you that defiles you. Because what comes out of you is a reflection of your heart, the real you. The heart, your heart, your spiritual heart, it's a mirror image of the real you. So that's what Jesus said in Matthew. Jesus also said in Luke 6, 45, a good man out of the treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure in his heart brings forth evil. 
Very important verse right here. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, what's in you comes out of you. And what comes out of you reflects what's in you. So some people, you know, they say, you, know, you ever heard people say, well, I slipped. Where'd that come from? Oh, I ain't never, I don't know where that came from. Well, if it came out of you, I can tell you where it came from. It came from within you. Because that's what is in you, that which comes out of you. If you have argument with that, take it up with Jesus. Because that's what he said. Language, attitude, the content of your speech. It's a reflection of what's on the inside of you. That's why the writer of the Proverbs in, the Proverbs in chapter 4 verse 23 says this. He says, keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. The, the New Living Translation says it this way. Guard your heart the most. Guard your heart the most for it determines the course of your life. Here's what jumps out at me when I read that scripture and it's so important. We right there see that you know what? You can change your heart. Matter of fact, the psalmist David in Psalm 51 said this. He said, create in me a clean heart. That was right after he failed. He had an, a moral failure and, and with Bathsheba. You probably have heard that story. Right after that is when he wrote Psalm 51. Creating, he, you know what? He wasn't saying, God, fix it. God, make it clean. He just said, God, would you give me a new heart? Creating me a clean heart. If you don't like how your heart is right now, if you don't like what's in your heart, you can get a new heart today. You can have God, with, with God's help, you can change your heart. You can have a new heart. So the truth is today, if I'm wanting to get order in my life, if I'm wanting to put things in their proper order, I begin with my heart, putting things right where they need to be because God also told Jeremiah, I search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Here's a good question to ask today. How do you measure or determine the condition or the health of your spiritual heart? The spiritual health of, of your heart, of my heart, is measured in regard to this term right here. Purity. That's the measure of my heart. Purity. Jesus said, blessed is the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Psalm 24 says this, who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who, who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands... And a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. That right there, that psalm was written by David. And, and he is the perfect character today to look at if we're going to talk about the heart. Because in spite of the fact that he was a liar, he was an adulterer, he was a murderer. He made a lot of mistakes as a father. In spite of all of those things, you know what God said of him? He said, he is a man after my own heart who will do my will. How many of you know you got to have the right, you got to have the right kind of heart. You got to have the right things in your heart to do the will of God. Because if you've got the wrong things in your heart, whose will are you going to accomplish? Your very own. David said, He's, wrote, he's the one that wrote that. Who shall it? David understood this idea of having a pure heart. And let me just tell you what we learn from that. And when knowing David's reputation, here's what we learn about purity. Purity doesn't mean perfection in actions. Purity means perfection in intention. We won't ever be perfect in action because we're human. But we can be perfect in intention and, and really the, the reality of my life is that I truly have a heart for God. How many of you would like to know how to have or what, what are some things today? I, got, I brought you some things today that will help you keep a heart for God. We're going to look at something else that David wrote and this is our text today. And I want to begin reading at verse 112 of Psalm 19. I'll give you just a second there. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 112. Listen to what David said. He says, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever. 
to the very end. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes. How many of you know that if you're going to make a change in your life, it has to happen at the heart level? There's a big difference between having a thought, having something, uh, a passing thought, something you think, hey, that might be a good idea, versus having accepted something new as far as what you believe. There are a lot of people in January who have thoughts something like, hey, you know what, I think I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to work out because I need to get in better shape. How many of you know that's one thing, but it's far different to change what's in your heart and say, you know what, I need to get healthy physically because my physical health is important. Do you see the difference between having a passing thought? If you only make change at the mind level... It's never going to last, and it's never going to stay. I have to make change at the heart level. I have to change what I believe about something. I can't live my life the way God wants me to live my life based on passing thoughts. No, I have to live my life based on what's in my heart, having changed what I believe about what God has said. So that's why change has to happen at the heart level, because I do. I want to establish order in my life, and I want it to stay. How about you? I want it to stay. I don't want it to be, I don't want it to come and go. I want it to stay. David said, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes. How many of you know that if you have to incline your heart to do something, it probably doesn't naturally find itself in that position? Incline. What do you think of incline? You're probably thinking about your recliner right now. You recline in your chair, but you have to incline it again to get out of it. Unless you're real lazy and just roll over the side or something. I've done both. But anyway, your heart naturally doesn't find itself inclined to do or to complete or to live by the statutes of the Lord. David said, I have to act on the current condition or the position of my heart. I have to make some changes so that now it will be inclined to perform your statutes forever. Here's a question. Do you think you just had to do that like one time? Like you just get saved at 12 years old at youth camp and you know, you're good to go for life. Do you think it happens that way? Do you, do you have to, to set it and then, how many of you remember that, uh, that infomercial about that rotisserie oven, uh, you know, years back? And, and their, their selling pitch was this, you set it and forget it. Wouldn't it be nice if your heart was like that? I, I just set it and I forget it. Hey, I went to church the first Sunday of the year. I'm, I should be good to go for the rest of it. But isn't it? Isn't it like this, that the heart, you have to set it, and then you check it, and then you set it again, and then you check it again, and then you set it, and then you check it. It's almost like a daily thing. What do you have to do if you're going to live obeying the precepts of the Lord? You have to keep setting it, and you have to keep checking it. Because why? If you don't keep setting it and checking it, what happens? Your heart returns to its reclined position. It's the nature of of the heart. Let me just ask you today, what is your heart's default position? What is your heart, your physical heart, your, I'm sorry, your spiritual heart? What is it's naturally in, what's it's naturally inclined to do? What's its natural inclination? Is it despair? Is it depression? Is it debauchery? Is it pride? Is it arrogance? I mean, what is, what is that thing that you deal with that if you don't keep things in check, oh man, it just runs away and all of a sudden, oh my goodness, I got to reel this thing in. I got to reel in this pride. I got to reel this, uh, this love for money in. I got to reel in my eyes and this lust of the flesh and this lust of the eyes and the pride of life. I got to reel it all in. Everybody's got something that if you just let your heart do what it wanted to do without being checked, it would just run away. It would just run away. Is anybody, can anybody relate to what I'm talking about today? Or is it just me? My heart, if I let it, it will go crazy. Just goes on its own way. 
That's why we have to take charge. That's why we have to guard our heart. Let's keep reading. Look at what David says. If I'm going to incline my heart to a certain position, he says in verse 113, I hate the double-minded. I hate the double-minded. I hate, I hate the double-minded. I hate. What in the world is that word doing here in the Bible? I thought we're supposed to love everything. I hate, I hate, I hate. Notice he's not talking about a person. He's talking about a condition. Double-mindedness is a condition. I hate the back and forth. How many of you can relate to what David was saying? I hate the back and forth of my heart. I hate the inconsistency of my heart. I think I, I hate the fact that some days I desire to please God and the other days I just desire to please my flesh and do whatever I want to do. Can anybody relate to how David was saying? David said, I hate my own double-mindedness. I don't ever know which part of me I'm going to get when I wake up in the morning. I, I hate the double-mindedness. Three things we're going to learn to do, and we're going to learn them from David today. If we're going to keep our heart inclined to serve the Lord, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to hate. I hate. I hate. There are going to be some things that you're going to have to come to hate. Hate, do you understand this? That hate is the most powerful motivating force or emotion that you have. Much stronger than love. And what I'm learning concerning the issues of the heart is that I have this love-hate relationship with a lot of things. And what I mean is that there are some things I should love, but I hate them. And there are some things that I should hate, but I love them. The tendency of the human heart is to love the wrong things and to hate the wrong things. It kind of reminds me of the story of David and his son Absalom. There was a time when Absalom rose up against his father David, who was king, and, to try, and tried to take his throne. And so while David flees to Jerusalem for safety, David's army and Absalom's army enter into a great battle. And eventually Absalom is killed. But when David finds out that his son Absalom has been killed... He mourns and in, is just is in tears for days. But Joab comes and finds him. Joab was David's general. Joab comes and finds him and says, King David, you need to get yourself together. He says, but listen, this is the problem. You right now are loving those that hate you, but are hating those that love you. Have you ever seen this in your life? You hate what's trying to deliver you, but you love what's trying to destroy you. I've recognized that pattern in me. I have the tendency to love the things that are trying to take me out while I hate the things that are trying to, to produce good or trying to produce life in me. You ever been there? Hate and love. This love-hate relationship. Probably one of the things in regard to this subject matter that we most easily can relate to is the subject of food. Physical diet. Why is it that things that taste rotten are good for you? And that things that taste so good will kill you? I know moderation is key. I know that. But, but, but food, food is one of those things. What we, we hate what we should love and we love what we should hate. Everybody has their thing. What, what is your go-to? What is that thing that you go to? Maybe it's your midnight snack. Maybe it's your any time of the day snack. I don't know. It can be anything. Maybe it could be chocolate. Maybe it's ice cream. Some people love that late night cereal. Some people love that 2 a.m. in the morning little Debbie cake. <laughs> Maybe it's Skittles candy. Maybe it's apple pie. Maybe it's Slim Jim's. Maybe it's uh, Doritos. Oh, there's nothing like a Dorito slapping you on the tongue when you're in the midst of frustration and anxiety. For me, it's pistachios. I love pistachios. Everybody in my family loves, knows that I love pistachios. I got five different two-pound bags of pistachios for Christmas, all from different people. 
But let me just tell you something. Pistachios do something for me. I mean, I have a problem, really. I can sit down. The problem is I can eat a whole two-pound bag in one setting. So I know, listen, y'all looking at me. I know some of y'all eat a whole box of little Debbie cakes in one setting, so. But listen, pistachios, let me just tell you, I mean, pistachios, they do something for me. I mean, they have been with me in the midnight hour. They have been with me when I could not call on anybody else, when there was no one else around. I could turn to those pistachios and just sit down and eat a whole bag and feel so good. But again, we're back to this love-hate relationship because when it comes to pistachios, I love how they feel when they're going down, but I hate what they do to my waistline. How many of you know a lot of things in life are like that? It's not that the things that we have the tendency to love that we shouldn't, it's not that they don't do something for us. They do some things for us, but the problem is not what they do for us. The problem is what they do to us. There's a lot of things that we need to look at in life. There's a lot of things we need to look at that are found within our heart. And it's not that they don't do something for us. The problem is what they do to us. You ever order something off the menu at a restaurant knowing you're going to pay for it later? Those spicy hot buffalo wings that you know they burn going down and they, they burn other times too. But you just got to get at least one. I mean, your lips sweat. I mean, you order things off the menu and you know you're going to pay for it later. Can I just tell you, why is it still that in life we choose some things that feel good? I mean, they do a lot for us, but it's what they do to us. That's the problem. It's the same thing with life. Everything that you order in life, you either pay for or you reap from at a later time. That is the reason why we have to learn to hate some things. Drugs will do something for you. Yeah, oh yeah, it'll give you a high. But what it does after the fact, what it does to you. Premarital sex, oh yeah, it'll do something for you. But it's what it does to you. It's how it affects your mentality and future marriage. Adultery, oh yeah. There's a lot of things that feel good in the moment, but our heart, we got to when examine our heart and make sure that we don't allow things in our heart. It's not what it does for us. It's what it does to us. It's the long-term effect. Pornography. Yeah, it does a lot for you in a moment, but it's what it does to you that's the problem. And that it fills you with grief and it fills you with shame and it separates you from the presence of God. How about anger? Anger will do a lot for you. Oh, it'll, it might get you some results. But the problem with anger is after you, you, know, after you get done blowing somebody out, and, and sometimes it's legitimate, sometimes it's, 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 uh, you know, it's justifiable, but the problem with anger is that after you've blown somebody out, then you're there alone. Because nobody's going to hang around you if you're angry. I have to learn. This is the first thing David says. David says, I have to learn what to hate. Do you know that, turning the the switch a little bit, do you know that there is a healthy kind of hate? I hate racism. And the hate for that is a motivating factor. I hate racism. I hate to see somebody judged just on the based on the color of their skin. I hate to see people judged based on the kind of car that they drive or the kind of clothes that they wear. I hate bullying. I was bullied in the eighth grade. I know what it feels like. I hate bullying. We got to take now, you know, we got to hate the right things. That's what I'm trying to say. We got to learn to hate the right things. It is a great motivating factor. God, show us what to hate. We tend to love what feels good. We tend to hate what requires discipline. And here's such an important thing. You don't have to accept that which your heart is naturally inclined to. You can incline your heart to the ways of God. Let's continue. David said, I hate double-mindedness, but I love your law. The next verse, 114. You are my hiding place You are my hiding place. Here's another thing to put my heart in order. First, I have to hate the right things. But then secondly, I got to learn where to hide. 
I hate, but I also, I hide. Do you know where to hide? You better know where to hide. Because when life happens and you go through loss and you go through sickness, you go through the battles of life, the fiery darts of hell are coming at you, uh, all kinds of things you might face. And when they come at you, they will try to alter the position of your heart. They'll try to, they'll try to change what you believe. They'll try to get you to, to change and rethink everything you've believed all your life. They try to take you back. They try to get you hurt. They try to get you stuck. But this idea of hiding, knowing where to hide. See the, the, and, and by the way, this, this act here that we're talking about here in this passage, hiding here is not an act of cowardice. It's an act of safety. The important thing is that we know where to run. Do you know where to run when you come under attack? Do you know what, what's the right place to run to? It's important that we know the right place to run and not the wrong place to run. David said, you are my hiding place. That word there means he's my shelter. He is my covering. He hides me even in secrecy. That word is used, secrecy. But here's the thing about your hiding place. You have to determine in advance where you're going to run when you come under fire in life. If you, don't, if you haven't determined in advance where you're going to run, if you don't have a predetermined place that you're going to run into when you come under fire, if not, then you might follow everybody else's scurrying and follow them somewhere that you don't need to be. Elijah did that, kind of. Elijah ran to a cave. You remember that story? He ran to a cave to escape the judgment of Jezebel. The problem was that when he ran into the cave, he ran away from his calling. You remember God says, he comes to him and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you running? Didn't I protect you before? Didn't I come through? Didn't I respond with fire on Mount Carmel? Didn't I protect you? See, if you don't know where to run when you come under fire, life can cause you to give up the fight. Life can cause you to disengage from your calling. God can cause you to, to run away from the virtues of God instead of running to them. Let me just drop some revelation on you today, and this is what God has been showing me. Most of the time, the hiding place of God does not remove you from the battlefield. In other words, God doesn't give you an escape route. No, let me tell you, the hiding place of God, you know what hiding in God means? The hiding place of God means that I'm covered, I am protected right while I'm standing on the battlefield. It's like you have a force field around you. Listen to me, listen to me. If, if you are serving God today and if you've determined to give Him your whole heart, the ways of God, the assignment of God, it's not about escaping when things get rough. No, it's about being protected while you're fighting. It's about being, him being your shield so that you don't have to disengage and run away from what he's called you to do. No, when David said, you are my hiding place, he means that I can hide in you right while those fiery darts are whizzing by my head. I don't have to worry. Why? Because you're still my shelter. You're still my fortress. You're still my God. Come on, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will, this, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's not what David was saying in that I got a hiding place that I run to and I exit and I leave the battlefield. No. Oh, the blessing of God and the, the security of God that comes in knowing that I don't have to leave. I don't have to, to hit eject. I don't have to escape. No, right where I stand, right what I'm and right in what I'm doing, God protects me. He is my shelter. He is my comfort. He is my shield. I can even be held in secrecy right out in the open. You can hide in plain sight when you hide in him. Too many people hide in the wrong places. By the way, everybody has a hiding place. Some people have multiple hiding places. Multiple hiding places. Blame is a hiding place. Blame is a hiding place. People 
I blame people. Nothing's my fault. Nothing's my responsibility. It was their fault. If that hadn't have happened, I'd have a good life. If they didn't abuse me, I'd have a good life. If they didn't walk out on me, man, my life would be so different. We blame people. We blame situations. The problem with blame is that it's a convenient hiding place, but the result is that it shields you from the inconvenience of change. And if you just blame everybody else from your circumstances, you're never going to change anything within your heart. What's your hiding place? What is your hiding place? Maybe it's an image thing. Maybe you hide in pretending. Maybe you project a false image or this false happiness, this false security. But the problem is when you hide behind an image, you don't have to deal with the real you. And if you stay in that place, you harbor things in your heart that should not be there. Yeah. I hear the Spirit saying, come on out. Come out of hiding. and The hiding in the wrong things. Come out of hiding. Come hide in me. Come hide in me. We have a little Jack Russell. Her name is Penny. And uh, anytime she sees me, she knows what I'm going to say. I'm going to say it's time to go out because it's Every, nobody else who lives in my house remembers to go out. So when I say, Penny, it's time to go out to use the bathroom, inevitably she runs. She's got her place. She runs behind the couch and hides every time. The problem with the fact that she goes every time and hides in the same spot, she gets stuck every time under the couch. Every time. You'd think she'd figure that out. Maybe she wants to. I've let her just get stuck for a while and just see how long it took her to, for, for her to start whining and crying. Of course, you know, then we got to pick up one end of the couch so she can get out. But do you understand the problem with running to the wrong places is sometimes you get stuck in a place. And the place you got stuck in is worse than the thing you were running from. To what do you run? Don't get stuck somewhere. That you should have never been in the first place. Don't get stuck because you ran into a relationship that was ahead of God's timing. It was out of God's will. Don't rush into a job position. Don't get stuck there until you know it's God's will. I mean, this this is a principle of life. It's not just when we're fighting. It's not just when we're in battle. It's life. Don't run to anything else but Him. Make sure He is your hiding place. Make sure he's your hiding place. One last thing. David said, I know what to hate. I know where to hide. Here's what he says thirdly. I know where to hope. I know where to to hope. I hope in your word. Notice he doesn't say, I have hope. He says, I hope. uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but grammatically speaking, typically hope is a noun or a pronoun. But here in this passage, it becomes a verb. It becomes a word of action. He didn't say, I have hope. He said, I hope. The word here, hope, means I wait upon or I expect. In other words, he said, when I wait, or when he said, I hope in your word, he's saying basically, I wait on your word. I, with great expectation, wait on your word to be fulfilled in my life, waiting on your promises to come to pass. I want you to ask, I want to ask you to stand. Just stand with me if you, if you have hope this morning. hope I have hope because I have determined 
to hope. I hope in him. I hope in your word, Lord. I hope in your promises, that your promises are going to be fulfilled in my life. What are some of the promises that God has given to us? How about this scripture that says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. How about this scripture? Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. Oh, what a promise. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. How about this promise? No weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. That helps me keep my heart inclined to the virtues of God, serving God, giving Him every part of my life. Three things we can remember today. And I'm asking God that would speak to you those things this morning. That He would show us what we need to be hating. That he would show us where we we need to hide. That he would show us how to hope. See, the reality is if if we're going to get things in order, in the right order of our lives, there's some sins we're going to have to begin to hate. There's some idols we're going to have to let go. You remember what the Word of God says? Remember the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What are the gods of today? Think about it. What are the gods of today? Everybody has their own God. You shall have no graven image. What are the graven images today? Cell phones, televisions. It can be anything. But I just feel like the Lord would have us take a look within this morning and say, if you have a heart for him, just to begin to examine yourself. Maybe you can't say, I honestly have placed God at the number one position of my life and I need to make some adjustments this morning. God, I don't want you to be fifth or sixth or 10th in my life. I want you to be first in my life. I want you to be first. probably some folks here this morning who are dealing with double-mindedness. You want to serve God most of the time, but then there's some days. Man, God, help us to hate the double-mindedness. Some of us here, I'm sure, we run to the wrong places. God, help us to hide in you. Some of us are hoping in the wrong things. God, help us to hope in you. How many of you in here would say this morning, God, I want you to have my heart. I want to give you my heart. I want to give you everything. If you desire that every part of you. See, it's a matter of, does he have your whole heart? Worship the Lord thy God with thy whole heart. And him only should you serve. Does he have your whole heart? Come on, I want to see your hands lifted up high. If you want to give him your whole heart, would you just lift your hand and say, God, would you take my heart? Would you take my heart? I give you everything. I give you everything. I give you everything. I'm going to open up this altar this, this, altar this morning. If you are here and you just desire to spend some time around the altar, can I remind you that in the New Testament, do you know what the heart is? The heart is the altar of the Lord. It's it's just where you come and say, God, I'm yours. Every part of me, every part of me, I surrender to you. God, today I've come to give you my heart. If that's what you want to pray today, if you'd like someone to pray with you, that you could get some things in their proper order. Come on, as we sing, gather around here. We'll pray with you. We'll encourage you. We'll lift you up before the King. 
of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, oh, you can have my heart. You can have my heart. Oh, 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 you can have my heart. Come on, anybody, say, God, I come to give you my heart tonight. Take everything. Oh. Come on, lift your hands. Come on, say, if you want, if you want my heart, oh, you got it, you got it, you got it. If you want my heart, you got it, you got it. If you want my heart, you got it. It belongs to you anyway. Yes, it belongs to you anyway. Thank you, Jesus. It belongs to you anyway. I determined that today. I align my heart. I incline my heart to the ways of God today. Lord, I just pray over every person here in this room, and I pray over our online audience right now. I pray that today, God, you would help us to learn to love the right things and at the same time hate the things that are trying to take us, take our destiny, take our, take our, our blessings, take our future, take our destiny. Thank you, Lord. We're loving the right things. We're hating the wrong things. We're learning where to hide, God. And now we're determining today. We have a predetermination right now. When trials come, I run to you, Lord. I run to you. I run to you. You are my hiding place. You are my confidence. I run to you. Lord, I hope in you. Help us to hope in you. You are our hope. I trust and I hope in your words. Your words is what I depend on. The promises of God, they carry me, they sustain me. I give you my heart. I give you my hopes. I give you my dreams. I give you my future. I give you my plans. Every part of me, my heart reflects what I am. And today I give you my heart. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you today for helping us order our heart. I'm going to be praying over you in the days to come that God will help you and I both order our heart that we might please him. We want a heart for him. Amen. Can we give him praise today for speaking to us today? For his wonderful presence. He is a good God.
We're so grateful that you're here. It's so good to see you. We love you. We'd love to see you again back next week. Have a great week in his presence. Until next time, be blessed.